Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. This section is called matrix inverses and determinants. And I bet a lot of you can assume what a matrix inverse is already. We'll just jump right in with it. A matrix inverse of some matrix M is denoted by M with the negative one power that we normally see for inverses and is the matrix representation of the inverse linear map, L inverse, where L is the linear map corresponding to M, the matrix M. So it's just the fact that linear maps have inverse linear maps, so matrices, which are just representations of linear maps, should have inverse representations as well. Um, an easier characterization, and British spelling there by accident, is that M, and then you take a matrix multiplication with its inverse, gives you the identity matrix, which you'll recall is 1, 0, 0, with dots, 0, 1, 0, dots, 0, 0, 1, dots. So diagonal ones and zeros everywhere else. And you also want M inverse times M to be the same. So that's an equivalent characterization. That's actually a lot of times easier. This is how we, we try to find them. Um, but what they actually are is, is the matrix representation of the inverse linear map. So let's go ahead and start out with, you know, why would these be important? And probably what every linear algebra course is going to tell you is systems of linear equations. Actually, in fact, a lot of linear algebra courses start the entire semester with these uh, rather than the, the direction we took today. So let's just start with a system of linear equations, maybe 2x plus 3y equals 7, x minus 2y plus z equals 4, and z plus y equals 3. Solve for x, y, and z. Let's go ahead and do it. We'll do it by substitution, where we can solve the first row for x by subtracting 3y from both sides and dividing by 2. We get that x is 7 halves minus 3 halves y. And then you would go ahead and plug this in for x there, which gives us 7 halves minus 3 halves y minus 2y plus z equals 4. And I could solve this for z. If I solve this for z, I end up with z is, well, we're going to have 4 minus 7 halves. 4 is 8 halves, or 1 half. And we have negative 2y minus 3 halves y. It's a total of negative 7 halves y, or plus 7 halves y on the right-hand side. That's going to be what z is equal to in terms of y. And then we go ahead and grab that and plug it in for y here, or for z here. And then plug it in for z. And we end up with uh, 1 half plus 7 halves y plus y equals 3. If I subtract 1 half from both sides and combine my terms in y, I have 9 halves. y is 5 halves, which equivalent gives me that y is 5 ninths. Now that I know that y is 5 ninths, I can plug that in here, 5 ninths, to get 1 half plus 45 eighteenths, and 1 half is 9 eighteenths, so 54 over 18, which thankfully works out to 3. And then finally, we know that x has a representation in terms of y as well. So plug 5 ninths in for y. And we get 7 halves uh, minus 15 eighteenths. Uh, 7 would be 63 eighteenths. So 63 minus 15 is 48 over 18, which unfortunately doesn't simplify quite as easily, but it's divisible by 6, and we end up with 8 thirds. So it turns out x is 8 thirds, z is 3 y is 5 minutes. Now you can totally do that with substitution, but I want to mention, we'll take it from a black box here, right? So given the matrix, let's look at the matrix M given by the coefficients from the above. So let's grab these coefficients of 2, 3, and a 0 in Z, 1, negative 2, 1, and really a 0, 1, 1. Let's do that. 2, 3, 0, 1, negative 2, 1, and a 0, 1, 1. We 
have m inverse, and I won't tell you how to get there yet, but we have m inverse, and it's given by 1 ninth times 3, 3, negative 3, 1, negative 2, 2, negative 1, 2, 7. And let's go ahead and look at, I'm going to observe m inverse times the right hand side as a vector. So let's consider the right hand side as a vector 7, 4, 3. That's going to give me 1 ninth times, well, let's think about it. The 7 just goes here, the 4 goes here, the 3 goes here, and it does that all the way down. So I have 7 times 3 plus 4 times 3 minus 3 times 3. And then I have 7 times 1 minus 2 times 4 plus 2 times 3. And I have 7 times negative 1 or negative 7 times 1 plus 2 times 4 plus 7 times 3. If I add all these together, I have looks like 21 plus 12 is 33 minus 9 is 24. I have 7 minus 8 is negative 1 plus 6 is 5. And I have negative 7 plus 8 plus 21 is 1 plus 21 is, is 22. And if I go ahead and simplify, if I pass my 1 ninth inside and simplify, I have 24 ninths. I can divide numerator and denominator by 3 and get 8 thirds. I have 5 ninths and I have 22 ninths. Now if I compare to my solutions from earlier, I've got 8 thirds, 8 thirds, 5 ninths, 5 ninths, and 22 ninths, and here I wrote a 3. So what's going on? Everything is the same except for this last case. It makes me think maybe I made a mistake. Now that I'm looking, I did make a mistake. 7 halves times 5 ninths is 35, not 45. So when I add it to 9 eighteenths here, I get a 44 over 18. And 44 over 18 is, believe it or not, 22 ninths. And so there you see that, in fact, the inverse matrix was able to solve my system just with a quick matrix multiplication on that vector. And that's kind of the that's kind of like the motivation here. What we want to think is that inverse matrices solve systems of equations, linear equations, very, very fast. So the idea is sometimes you'll have something like ax plus by plus cz equals, let's say, w. Uh, dx plus ey plus fz equals u, and gx plus hy plus iz equals v. Then the solution is always this inverse matrix. So it's a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, inverse on the vector w, u, v. This will always work, and it works in any number of dimensions. Um, I'm just giving you the example in three dimensions. So this is really quite an efficient procedure. The question then becomes, how easy is it to find an inverse matrix? Not terrible, is what I'll say. Not great. But what you'll do is solve one system of equations to then solve them all. So what's kind of important is up top here, w, u, and v were extremely arbitrary. I could have put whatever three numbers I wanted in there. And so rather than every time if I chose w was 6, u was 4, and v was 7 or something, then solve the system, and then at a later instance, for some reason, I want an 8, negative 2, and 7, to then resolve the entire system, what inverting the matrix allows me to do is just find this, and then every time I'm given a new right-hand side, I just go ahead and plug the right-hand side in. So that's what we're going to see, is we're going to try to compute the matrix inverse as a solving one system of equations to solve them all. So we can do this. We can find it from its definition. So let's recall the definition. If I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, inverse, it's defined to be the matrix so that when I multiply by A, B, C, D, E, F, 
g h i, I always recover the identity. So the question is, what should the matrix here be? Well, we don't exactly have good formulas, not great formulas, let me spell, in dimension other than two. I'll say dimension greater than two, strictly greater. So in two dimensions and one dimension, there's a pretty easy formula. One dimension, what's your one dimensional matrix look like? It looks like A, in which case A inverse is one divided by A, believe it or not, really big surprise. But in dimension two, your life is really not that bad. So let's see, in dimension two, we can get away with A, B, C, D. The inverse matrix is one divided by a, D minus B, C. And then what we do is we swap A and D and we add a minus sign to B and C. So we've got two things happening. We swap A and D, so we get D, A, and then we add a minus sign to B and C. So that's all we have to do in two dimensions. I'm not gonna give you any of the other formulas. You would have a horrendous time memorizing them. They exist, um, but they're, they're, they're just, they're really ugly. So don't, don't even try to look them up or anything. We'll primarily basically be using this in this course, and then I'll show you how to do it for a three-dimensional setting. But maybe I'll write here, we will use this primarily. And then I'll show you how to do it in a three-dimensional setting. But let's look at the example of this two-dimensional one first. Solve the system of equations. Let's do x plus 2y equals 6, and let's do 2x minus y equals 3 using matrix inverses. So all I have to do is I'm going to extract the matrix, which is the four coefficients. So my matrix is going to be 1, 2, 2, negative 1. I'm going to compute its inverse, and then I'm going to go ahead and grab the right-hand side and put it in as a vector on the right. How do I compute the inverse? Well, I just identify what is A, B, C, and D, and I put them in A, B, C, D, a, B, C, D, I put them all in the right spot. Let's go ahead and do that. One divided by A, D, minus B, C, and then the matrix is A and D swap, so I have D, A, negative B, negative C. And this is still acting on the vector six, three. I then go ahead and compute one divided by negative one minus four, negative one, negative two, negative two, one, acting against six, three. And then every time we see a matrix on a vector, this really is a matrix. This is just a two row, one column matrix. And so when we have our matrix multiplication, what do we do? We make the left-hand side rows and the right-hand side columns, there's only one of them, but we make it there. And then we do all possible inner products. And we just look at the overlap. So the inner product of negative one, negative two against six, three is negative one times six or negative six, negative two times three, negative six. And then they overlap on the top, top coordinate. And then I have all the inner product of negative two against uh, six is negative 12 and one against three is three. And they overlap on the bottom coordinate. I'm left with one over negative five here. And it looks like my first entry is negative 12 over negative five, also known as 12 fifths. My second entry is negative nine over negative five, also known as nine fifths. That's all we have to do to solve our system. Should we verify? Let's verify really quick. Verify really quick. So this would be X and this would be Y. Let's go ahead and plug 12 fifths in for x. I get 12 fifths times 1 plus plugging in 9 fifths for y. I have 9 fifths here. And then 12 fifths for x and 9 fifths for y. Let's go ahead and solve these. 12 fifths plus 2 times 9 fifths, that's 18. So a total of 30 fifths. What are 30 fifths? 6. Here I have 24 minus 9 fifths is 15 fifths. And how many is that? 3. And what do you know? You immediately recover the solution. So that's a nice example of solving a system by matrix inversion. Let's just do one example of a matrix inverse in 3D. So let's find the matrix inverse of 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, 1 inverse by computing 
exactly what we want to compute. 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, 1 against A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and force it to be equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and forcing that equality. So how are we going to compute this? Well, there's a matrix multiplication, so we're going to consider all columns on the right, all rows on the left, and perform all inner products. What are we going to be left with? Well, ADG acts against 1, 0, 1, and we get A plus 0 plus G. BEH acts against 1, 0, 1, and we get B plus 0 plus H. And CFI acts against 1, 0, 1, we get C plus 0 plus I. ADG acts against 0, negative 1, negative 1, and we get negative D minus G. BEH acts against 0, negative 1, negative 1, and we get negative E, negative H. CFI acts against 0, negative 1, negative 1, and we get negative F minus I. ADG acts against 1, 1, 1, we get A plus D plus G. BEH acts against 1, 1, 1, we get B plus E plus H. And CFI acts against 1, 1, 1, we get C plus F plus I. So that's what the left-hand side becomes. We want it to be equal to the right-hand side. Want equality. So if they were equal, all we do is we compare these terms together, and 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 these terms together. What we recover is, and I know everybody loves this, a system of nine equations and nine unknowns. So unfortunately, we do just have to write them down and solve the system. So let's go ahead and write down our system of nine equations and nine unknowns. Our first one, a plus g is one. Our second one, b plus h is zero. Our third one, c plus i is zero. Our fourth one, minus d minus g is zero. Our fifth one, minus e and h gives me one. Our sixth one, minus f minus i gives me zero. Our seventh one, a plus D plus G gives me zero. Our eighth one, B plus E plus H gives me zero. And our final one, C plus F plus I gives me one. So looks terrible. They're not the end of the world. And, and the reason I'll say that is because it's really, it's really a three sets of three equations. So we do want to make it three sets of three. If I just look at all of the A, D, G cases, there's only three of them. And if I look at all of the B, E, H cases, there's only three of them. And if I look at all the C, F, I cases, there's only three of them. So it is three sets of three equations, but really it is a system of nine. But anyway, with that said, let's go ahead and solve the A, D, G equations. What do we have? A equals one minus G. So then negative D minus G is zero. And our last case of A, D, and G, if A is one minus G, we have one minus G plus D plus G equals zero. We see that the G's cancel. We get that one minus uh, one plus D is zero, or we get that D has to be negative one. Once we get that D has to be negative one, that gets replaced with negative one. We get one minus G is zero, or that G is one. Once we know G is one, we put G is one here. We get A is zero. And so we find A, G, and D pretty quick. We can do the same thing with the next system with the B's, E's, and H's. We have something like B plus H is zero or B is negative H, which means that in the second equation, I have negative E plus B is one. In the third equation, B is negative H. I have negative H plus E plus H is zero. The H's cancel and I get that E is zero. Well, if E is zero, then the second equation gives me B is one. And if B is one, the third equation gives me H is negative one. So I found three more, and I can continue one more time by solving the system of the C's, the I's, and the F's. My first equation, C plus I equals zero, is the same as C is negative I, which in the second equation, negative F minus I is zero, gives me that negative F plus C is zero, or equivalently, C equals F. And the third one, since I know C and F are the same, I have two F plus I equals one, but I know that uh, negative I is C, so that's two F minus C, but C and F are the same. So that's just F equals one. Once I know F equals one, I know that C equals one, and I know that I equals negative one. So there's my last three, and I can plug them all back in to my actual A, B, C, D, E, F, 
GHI matrix as A is 0, B is 1, C is 1, D is negative 1, E is 0, F is 1, G is 1, H is negative 1, and I is negative 1. And there is my inverse matrix. So this is the inverse matrix of the matrix I started with, 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 1, 1. So anyway, that's how you would go about calculating an inverse of a 3 And your life only gets harder when you go up in dimension. So fortunately, it's not the world's uh, most exciting thing to do, but you will be quizzed on one of those 3 by 3s at least once this semester. It's definitely a rite of passage. Let's talk about our next topic, which is called determinants. And determinants are a quick way of deciding if a matrix is invertible. So invertible meaning has an inverse. So with that said, let's just make a really quick remark. All invertible matrices, in, I can spell invertible matrices, are square. Okay, so that's a really nice statement to make. Um, hence, if not square, not invertible. However, this is a case where all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Some square matrices are not invertible. So if you tried to go ahead and solve the system of equations that we just did, even though my matrix is square, there's going to be some cases where the system just doesn't have a solution. Now that wasn't the case here, but there will be some cases. Let's look at the following. Let's just do 2, 1, negative 4, negative 2 as a 2 by 2 matrix. And let's try to compute its inverse. Let's just do the shorthand. That was 1 divided by AD, so 2 times negative 2, minus uh, B, C, so 1 times negative 4, and then the rest of the matrix was A and D traded places, so we get negative 2 and 2, and then B and C became negative, so negative 1 and positive 4. Let's go ahead and compute this. I get 1 divided by negative 4 minus negative 4, so plus 4, then negative 2, negative 1, 4, 2. What happened in the denominator is that this is equal to 0, so we've divided by 0. So that means that this just doesn't exist. And so the inverse doesn't exist. And so there's a nice example of a square matrix that's just not invertible. There's not much you can do about it. And the determinant is a quick way of deciding if that's the case. Now, where was the determinant here? The determinant hides in our formula. So the determinant was hiding in our inverse formula as well, the determinant, at least of a two-dimensional matrix, A, B, C, D, was that denominator, A, D, minus B, C. So it was that denominator. Now let's actually see what a determinant is in reality. The determinant is, and I'm going to introduce it in kind of the formal definition sense that we don't really need to pay too much attention to, but we'll, we'll, we'll define it this way first. It's the unique number associated to matrices satisfying three properties. Number one, the determinant of the identity matrix. So that's this matrix, you know, with ones and zeros in any number of dimensions is one. That the determinant of if I take A times a column, and I'm going to write the column as a vector, because you can kind of think about columns as vectors, plus B times a column. So if I'm combining those into a single column, this is A times the determinant of only the column V, plus B times the determinant of only the column W. This is just linearity, right? Linearity on columns linear on columns. And finally, three, that the determinant of any matrix which contains two identical columns, let's say two columns are identical,
then you recover zero. So it turns out there's only one number associated to the collection of all matrices that satisfies all of this, and that's called the determinant. Well, that's really quite vague. Let's see it in dimension one. Dimension one, what is the, the unique determinant of a matrix with one entry A? It's A. Congratulations, we found it. In dimension two, we've already seen it. The determinant of A, B, C, D is equal to A, D minus B, C. In any number of other dimensions, it's not too hard to compute. Let's say in dimension N, what you do is two steps. You first you choose the top row. You choose the top row of your matrix. And then for each entry in the top row, multiply that entry by the determinant of the sub matrix constructed from all other columns without the top row. In step three, you add all of these together, starting positive and alternating with positive minus signs. Okay, well that's like really abstract and strange. What do you mean by that? For example, let's go to the second dimension from the first dimension. So I start with my matrix, A, B, C, D, and I wanna take its determinant. What I do is I isolate the top row. So I have an A and a B, A and a B. For each entry in the top row, multiply it by the determinant of the submatrix constructed from all other columns without the top row. Okay then. So I get rid of the top row, but for the element A, I'm constructing it from the submatrix from all other columns. So A is in the first column, so I'm gonna do the submatrix in not the first column, that's the submatrix D, so it's gonna be A times the determinant of D, and then I do the same thing with B, B times the determinant of everything except for the column that B is in. So everything except for the column B is in, is the determinant of C. And then I go ahead and add, in step three, I add everything together with a plus sign and then a minus sign. And so what I'm left with is A times the determinant of D minus B times the determinant of C, but I know what the determinant of a one dimensional matrix is, so I get AD minus BC. Okay, so that's pretty uninformative. Let's do the dimension three from the dimension two. We're gonna take the determinant of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. What I do is I isolate the first row, A, B, and C. So I've got A, B, C, and they multiply. So A is going to multiply by the determinant of the submatrix, which shares neither a row nor a column. So that's this submatrix, E, F, G, H, or H, I. And then B is multiplied by the determinant that doesn't share a column with row or column with B, that's D, G, F, I. And C is multiplied by the determinant of the submatrix that shows shares no rows or columns with C, that's D, E, G, H. And then I go plus, minus, plus. Now if I actually work these out, what is this determinant? That's E, I, minus F, H. This determinant is D, I, minus F, G, and this determinant is D, H, minus G, E. And so my overall determinant of a three by three matrix ends up being, so the A is multiplying all of this, B is multiplying all of that, C is multiplying all of that, is A, E, I, minus A, F, G, minus B, D, I, there's two negatives now, plus B, F, G, plus C, D, H, minus C, G, E. And you just keep continuing into as many dimensions as you want. I'll never make you do dimensions higher than three in this, in this course. But since I've written it here, let's just go ahead and compute the determinant of one, two, zero, zero, one, two, zero, three, two. 
if I compute this determinant, what do I have to do? I can either just immediately go right for the formula, or I can actually play my games. I'm going to take this one. I'm going to go on by that submatrix. The determinant of that submatrix is 2 minus 6. I'm then going to alternate sign and take a 2 times the determinant of this submatrix, so the 0, 0, 2, 2, and that'll give me a 2 times the 0 times 2 is 0, minus 2 times 0 is 0. And I'm going to add this times that submatrix, 3, which is going to be 0 times 3. Oh, there's a zero up top anyway. Zero times three is zero. Minus zero times one is zero. And what I'm left with is one times two minus six, which is going to give me negative four. So that's how you can calculate those determinants. I'll end this class with the statement of why we care. We care because the following. If the determinant of a matrix equals zero, then M inverse doesn't exist. And what this does is it saves us time. That's all this does. This statement is an incredibly strong statement, very important statement, but the most important thing it can do is save us time. We don't have to waste our time trying to find an inverse if an inverse doesn't exist. Anyway, I'll stop there. I hope you like the course. I'll see you soon. Bye.